All right. So I think a lot of elements of this story of one of the most notorious family lines in Greek mythology is going to be of interest to Gothic enthusiasts. Um, I'm going to give a rundown of the lineage of the House of Atreus and then make the, ca the case for the play Agamemnon by Aeschylus uh, to be read as Gothic literature. And uh, this is not capital G Gothic as it predates the genre by a few millennia. Um, but Greek myth has an undeniable influence on Western media as a whole. And I think as modern readers, uh, it's an interesting lens. And, you know, as I was pitching this, uh, I was, you know, making sure that I could make a case and flipped open the castle of Otranto. And the first name I saw was Hippolyta. And, you know, there's also the bust of Pallas in Pose the Raven. So, you know, there's definitely um, a classical tradition apparent in Greek lit or Gothic literature. So uh, some content warnings, um, all the content warnings. Uh, I don't plan on dwelling on any of these elements um, or going into lascivious detail, but there are incidents of rape, incest, pedophilia, cannibalism, suicide, and infanticide, um, along with plenty of just murder. Many of these incidents do involve children. So I've got some warnings for the really egregious stuff um, and everything, you know, I've got the warnings for each generation listed on each slide. Um, but this is also a story about cyclical intergenerational violence and it's pretty baked into the mythos. So if anything I just listed was a deal breaker, um, please don't feel obligated to stick around. Um, so some caveats on language for expediency, I'm going to be re referring to the characters as Greek, even though Unified Greece is anachronistic to the time. And I'm going to be talking a little bit about gender roles and presentation, and uh, it cannot be overstated how patriarchal this society was. We live in a patriarchal, patriarchal society now, and we have a long way to go, um, but I'll be talking about the theater later. And we're not sure if women were allowed to be in attendance. So that is the kind of overwhelming patriarchy that they lived in. Um, so I want to be clear, I do not endorse these views, uh, but they do inform the narrative. And the last thing is I am recounting a streamlined version of the story. Uh, Greek mythology is made up of folk tales and oral tradition passed from multiple city states across centuries. So there's going to be a lot of differences. And if I stopped every time to say, you know, well, in another version, we'd be here all day. So uh, this is built together from Homer, Aeschylus, Sophocles, Euripides, Apollodorus, who are all Greek, and then the Roman writer Seneca. So with all that being said, we're going to dive in. Uh, it's called the House of Atreus because of Homer referring to Agamemnon and Menelaus as the Atreides in his epics. But the generation of Atreus and his brother Thyestes uh, is actually the middle generation. So the family line and the doom of the family starts with Tantalus, a frequent dinner guest, the Olympians, um, though he keeps needling at them, doing things like stealing ambrosia, uh, giving away their secrets to humans, just lots of food crimes. And uh, the last straw is when he invites them over for dinner and serves his own son Pelops, who he has butchered and cooked. The Olympians know what is happening immediately, with the exception of Demeter, whose daughter Persephone had just been taken to the underworld. So she's distracted and nibbles on Pelops' shoulder. The gods revive Pelops and put him back together, and they fashion him an ivory shoulder to replace what Demeter ate. And um, they must have done a pretty good job because Poseidon immediately takes Pelops away to be his lover. Tantalus, however, is sent to Tartarus, um, the realm of punishment for wrongdoers. And in Greek cosmology, Hades is not synonymous with hell. The population of the underworld is very much a bell curve with some heroes exalted to Olympus or Elysium and some transgressors sent to Tartarus for punishment. But the vast majority of the dead just spent the rest of their death as shades. Uh, in the Odyssey, we see Agamemnon and other heroes from the Trojan War lingering around sort of aimlessly, waiting for new heroes to prove their heroism by making a journey to the underworld and talking to them. So uh, even these so-called great men of the era wound up in this gray bucket of nothing. Um, 
so this is relevant because Tantalus's punishment is extraordinary. He is rare among Greeks for his endless torment, which is to be always hungry and always thirsty, but the waters and food always within arm's reach recede when he reaches out for them. And so his name became the root of our word tantalize. Unfortunately, his uh, future generations learned nothing. His son Pelops, now put back together by the gods, is going to be the least problematic of the family for a while, but that is a very low bar. He won the hand of Hippodamea in a chariot race against Oenomaeus, her father. Um, and that was set up as a test for suitors because he heard a prophecy that he'd be killed by his son-in-law. So they all had to race a chariot race against him. And if they won, they got to marry his daughter, but if they lost, they would be executed. So I'm some early Gothic elements, tyrannical father figure, policing sexuality and holding it captive and literal Gothic because the heads of former suitors were displayed all around the palace. Pelops does win, he uses trickery to do it. He recruits the help of Oenomaeus's chariot driver, Myrtilus, who replaces the wheel axles with wax. So under friction, they melt and the chariot crashes, which kills Oenomaeus. I'm not sure if Hippodamea was ever consulted about Pelops as a suitor. In some versions, she um, was actually in on the scheme. Uh, and one presumes she was at least happy to be away from that kind of father. Uh, Myrtilus does not help out of the kindness of his heart. He assumed his prize for helping was also Hippodamea. He tries to force himself on her and Pelops stops him and hurls him off a cliff. And um, a pretty big cliff because he has time to scream a curse on the family on the way down, which is a little unfair because Pelops didn't really do anything wrong there, but Myrtilus's father was Hermes, so the curse stuck. Um, Pelops isn't great. He has a tendency to invite kings over to his palace and then kill them, um, even though they're supposed to be under treaty. And this is a violation of Xenia, which is the Greek guest host relationship. Um, and it's sort of a proto Airbnb before hotels existed. Um, and just a covenant between travelers that you would be safe going to someone of similar class and asking to be put up in their home and being treated well. And this was an incredibly important uh, covenant between people. Um, it was actually under the purview of Zeus. And it's one of the things that Paris violates by stealing Helen. It's one of the reasons that Odysseus just slaughtering the suitors at the end of the Odyssey is sort of okay is because they were violating Xenia. Um, so, you know, Pelops has done that. It's not great, but again, compared to the rest of his family, it's basically nothing. Um, so he and Hippodamea have several children. He also has a child with a nymph and the child's name is Chrysippus. Uh, Hippodamea uh, sees Chrysippus as being favored and possibly elevated to heir above her own children. He's a bastard, but he is the son of a nymph. Um, and so content warning for rape and pedophilia coming up uh, because Chrysippus is eventually abducted by the king of Thebes, Laius, who is from Oedipus. He will go on to be killed at a crossroads by his son Oedipus, um, which if I could editorialize, that's getting off rather light compared to what his wife and son go through, despite his actual wrongdoing. Um, Hippodamea and her two eldest, Atreus and Thyestes, go to ostensibly rescue Chrysippus, though they then kill him in the name of honor. This gets them all banished, Hippodamea hangs herself, and Atreus and Thyestes end up at Mycenae, which is not their ancestral home. They are initially installed as regents, but the current king dies in battle. So now it's up to the two brothers to decide who will be preeminent. This is not a smooth discussion. Uh, eventually, Atria suggests that whoever is in possession of the Golden Fleece, which is not the same one from Jason and the Argonauts, it's just a really good looking sheep. Um, whoever has that is clearly favored to be king. And you know he knows he's got one at home, so he thinks, this is all settled. What he doesn't know is that his wife, Ierope, has been sleeping with Thyestes and has given him the fleece. So Thyestes becomes king. Atreus throws a massive hissy fit. He appeals to the gods, uh, stomps his feet about how this is unfair. 
the gods agree. They make the sun travel backwards to the sky, which everyone agrees is a bad omen. And Atreus becomes king and Thyestes is banished. And um, this is where it's going to get rough for a while. Uh, all the trigger warnings, murder, including children, forced cannibalism, rape and incest, and suicide. Um, because Atreus, while he's sitting on his throne, has time to think about how Thyestes got his hands on the fleece. So one of the reasons that female fidelity was considered so important is that it ensured the preservation of bloodlines. Men can sleep around and have as many bastards as they want, and they're still the main line of succession. But with women, pre-DNA testing, uh, you're never quite sure who the father really is. With a woman who is known to be chaste and faithful, there is a reasonable certainty. But cheat even once, and everything is thrown into doubt. So by sleeping with Thyestes, IRB has contaminated the surety of Atreus's children. They have taken Agamemnon and Menelaus away from him. So Atreus takes Thyestes' sons in return. He invites them over under the guise of reconciliation, then takes the boys, kills them, cooks them, and serves them back to Thyestes. He is a mere mortal, so he does not know what he is eating until he is full, and Atreus shows him the hands and feet of his own sons. So this is obviously a huge transgression and, you know, has influenced horror writers throughout the ages. You know, we've got examples from Titus Andronicus by Shakespeare and Game of Thrones, um, because there's really little else that could be a worse thing to do to someone. You're annihilating their family, desecrating their bodies, and then being forced into one of the greatest taboos in the world, cannibalism. Um, and you could honestly make the case that people like Shakespeare weren't influenced by this event because you kind of get here on your own just by thinking, what's the worst thing you could do to someone? Uh, but, you know, based on his other work, Shakespeare knew his classics, so there probably is actually a direct link. So Thyestes is, of course, horrified. He runs to the Oracle at Delphi and asks how he can get his vengeance. The oracle tells him to go to a temple. There will be a woman there who will give birth to his avenger. He does so, but unfortunately, the woman there happens to be his daughter, Pelopea. She does not know it's her father, only that she has been raped and runs away, taking his sword with her. She winds up at Mycenae with Atreus, who marries her. Uh, she gives birth to the child and exposes him, leaving him for dead, but Atreus thinks it's his child and retrieves him. The son is Aegisthus. Uh, unbeknownst to him, he's raised with his cousins. Uh, when he's old enough, Atreus asks Aegisthus to kill Thyestes once and for all, uh, not knowing who he actually is and what he's asking him to do, which is a shame because he would have loved it. Uh, <laughs> Aegisthus dutifully goes, uh, but when he raises the sword his mother gave him, Thyestes recognizes it and tells him who he is. Pelopea is there and realizes who raped her and uses the sword to kill herself. I guess this learns the full extent of his family history and uses his mother's blood on the sword to convince Atreus that he did his duty. Atreus makes offerings of praise, then I guess this kills him. <laughs> he and Thyestes rule Mycenae for a short while, Agamemnon and Menelaus exiled to Sparta for a bit, but their eventual father-in-law Tyndarius helps them regain control of the city. Thyestes dies once and for all, and Aegisthus is left to the wilds. That was a lot of back and forth over Mycenae. So Agamemnon marries Clytemnestra, and they have several children. Menelaus marries her sister Helen, and we all probably know how that goes. On the expedition to Troy to get Helen back, the Greek ships meet up at an eastern city of Aulis before they sail east as a fleet. But once they are there, the wind stops. Artemis did this based on either a real or perceived slight from Agamemnon. Um, plus the whole family is already on the Olympian's bad side like three times over. So if he wants to sail again, a seer tells him he has to sacrifice his eldest daughter, Iphigenia. He feels duty bound to defend his brother's honor to get Helen back. So he calls Iphigenia to Aulis under the guise of offering her in marriage to Achilles, and then he does sacrifice his own daughter. 
And then he's gone for the next 10 years. So Clytemnestra has plenty of time at home to think about killing him. I guess this also sneaks back to Mycenae where they begin having an affair, which enrages her second daughter, Electra. And after the war, and many soldiers lost or dead along the way, Agamemnon makes it home safe and sound, only to get in the bath and immediately be murdered by Clytemnestra and Aegisthus. And her son Orestes is still quite young and doesn't know what to do. He, e he was either smuggled out of the palace by Electra, ran off on his own, or Clytemnestra sent him away before any murdering happened. Uh, either way, he consults with every oracle he can find because this is his dilemma. He's duty bound to avenge his father's murder. He's also duty bound not to kill his own mother. Eventually matricide wins out and with the help of Electra and his friend Pylades, he kills Clytemnestra and Aegisthus. He is immediately beset by the Furies, which are ancient entities that torment wrongdoers. He tries seeking sanctuary, but he can't get away until he appeals to Apollo, who defends him to Athena, who pardons him and dismisses the Furies. And that is the end of the notable members of the House of Atreus. Um, just to explain, uh, I put this picture up, Miss Danvers from uh, Rebecca, the Hitchcock movie, based on the Daphne du Maurier book. Um, and I just think it embodies Electra roaming around, staying at home, defending it against interlopers and just incredibly protective of this house and its legacy. Um, even though she probably shouldn't be. <laughs> so just to back up a bit, I want to talk about Ierope, who, again, was Atreus, you know, the one who's forcing people into cannibalism, his wife, the mother of Agamemnon and Menelaus, um, just because I think she's fascinating and doesn't really get top billing very much. Her father was Catrius, who was king of Crete. Uh, he heard a prophecy that one of his children would eventually kill him. His son and one daughter dutifully take themselves away to Rhodes, um, though in a few years, Catrius will decide that he wants to leave his kingdom to his son after all, goes to reconcile with the son, but the son not recognizing him does kill him. Um, the son realizes what he's done, and he walls himself into the cliffs in shame. Before all that, though, Catrius had two other daughters, Aerpe and Clymene. Clymene did nothing. Um, she just gets caught up in Aerope's trouble when she is caught sleeping with a slave in the home palace. Uh, according to some authors, some others, authors, she also did nothing and uh, Catrice is just trying to get rid of all of his kids. Um, he shunts them off to a young king, Nopleus of Euboea, uh, to do with them what he will, selling them into slavery. Uh, but apparently Nopleus had pity on them as he marries Clymene himself and marries Ierpe off to Atreus. And so I'm not sure where in the timeline um, Ierpe and Atreus get married. Um, there's actually all sorts of different timelines. She might have married someone named Pleisthenes or Pleisthenes is another name for Atreus. Um, but I, and that Agamemnon and Menelaus were actually placed in these kids, but I don't think that makes sense in the way that Atreus reacts to her cheating on him. Um, though I do think it might be post Chrysippus affair because they're both kind of damaged goods at that point. Um, and then Nopleus and Clymene also have several sons and their eldest is Palamedes, who is the one who tricks Odysseus into going to Troy by throwing his son Telemachus in front of the plow. Uh, Odysseus had been pretending to have gone mad and was driving weird furrows all over his farm, but he swerves to avoid hitting his son, which apparently proves his sanity, and he winds up going to Troy. Though once there, Odysseus and his BFF Diomedes conspire to frame Palamedes for conspiring with the Trojans, and Palamedes is executed. Nopleus swears vengeance, and places beacons in wrong places across the Aegean to divert ships and make them crash. Uh, he's also given credit with talking several Greek wives into cheating on their husbands while they're away at war, including encouraging uh, Clytemnestra and Aegisthus. So there are some lost plays that might have focused on Ierpe a little bit. There's Cretan women by Euripides, but uh, what we remain, you know, it's kind of a side story. Um, but it has a lot of influence on the main plot. So I just think it's really interesting. 
So just to list off some Gothic elements that I've noticed, profaned rituals like the killing of Iphigenia, um, crumbling mansion and society, uh, incredibly dysfunctional family, perverse sexuality, seduction, and just tons of blood. And I have this quote from the Iliad here with the Lattimore translation talking about the crumbling of society and how, you know, kids these days is a sentiment as old as time. Uh, you know, Hector was able to carry a boulder that two men these days couldn't lift together. And I just wanted to illustrate that. This is a picture of the treasury of Atreus, and you can kind of see the size of the stone compared to the people. So, you know, these are the kind of things that people, or maybe cyclopses through their cyclopean walls, uh, built. But now, you know, these days, no one can handle that anymore. And Orestes really is the last generation of the Age of Heroes, and it's all sort of downhill and mundane after that. So that is part one. I am going to stop sharing. And all right. So uh, right now we're going to do a close reading on some passages from Aeschylus's Agamemnon, which is the first play in the Oresteia trilogy. It portrays Agamemnon's homecoming and his murder. So just some quick context on uh, Greek drama as a whole. The Greek theater tradition started at the city Dionysia, which was a spring festival in honor of Dionysus. There would be three plays um, based on known mythical tales and then a comedic short called a satyr play, which is sort of like a Pixar short at the end to lift everyone's spirits before they go home. Um, because of historical records, we know that Aeschylus submitted somewhere between 70 and 90 plays and took home first prize 13 times. What remains are seven of his plays. So it's very difficult to tell what is a trend and what isn't because we only have a fraction of his work. Uh, but it does seem like Aeschylus was unusual in that he used his trilogies to tell a unified story. Um, other playwrights seem to do three plays around a theme, but with different myths. And the Oresteia is also our only surviving intact trilogy. Uh, the Oedipus cycle was, they were all performed separately. So these plays were funded by wealthy donors assigned to each playwright, and it was up to them how generous they wanted to be. Um, since it was in honor of Dionysus, they wouldn't be too cheap, but some were definitely more generous than others. Um, Aeschylus was, you know, well regarded in his, well regarded in his time, um, winning first prize 13 times, and the Oresteia is one of his last works. So he got a really generous producer for this one. Uh, it was really prestigious at the time. Um, and the set design is really preeminent throughout with many characters drawing attention to the house. Um, and while I think there's thematic reasons for that, it's also a bit of a flex. So yeah, to answer the question about recent or ancient, the Trojan War and the setting of the Oresteia is the end of the Mycenaean period, which would have been around the 13th century BCE. I mean, ask 10 classicists when the Trojan War happened, you're going to get 10 different answers. Um, and again, presuming it happened at all. Uh, so after that, there is a long Dark Ages period, um, which we don't know a lot about because the Dark Ages and also Linear B, the writing system, was the hot new tech at the time. And uh, Herodotus and Thucydides, our first historians, are still a few centuries off. So then even the Iliad and the Odyssey, which are you know, centuries after all this happened, are still centuries before Aeschylus. So yeah, it was a really long time ago. Um, the Citadel at Mycenae has never been lost. Uh, you know, there was the discovery of Troy, which was a big deal. Everyone always knew where Mycenae was, but it was ruins even um, in the classical Greek era. So, uh, that is a lot of years for myths to evolve. Um, the Greek audience would have been familiar with the bones of the stories, but this does give the playwrights a lot of room to add in surprises to keep things fresh for their audience. So uh, Agamemnon, the play, opens with a watchman's speech, um, sort of similar to Hamlet. Um, and uh, it sets the time and place and the mood. It's 10 years since the Greeks sailed to Troy. And he is waiting on the top of the palace for a signal flare that will indicate that Troy has fallen. 
And so I've queued up a clip that's on YouTube uh, that my pal Mike has brought to my attention. I think it's really good. It is in Greek, but um, there are English subtitles. So I am going to play that. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit um, in the interest of time. It's just, it's the dude chilling on the roof for the first like two minutes. So I'm going to scoot ahead. All right, so the parts that I really want to draw attention to are first comparing the strength of Clytemnestra to that of a man. Um, throughout, I'm gonna be using the Fagel's translation. It's slightly different than um, the closed captioning that was on there, um, but he says, she so she commands full of her high hopes that woman, she maneuvers like a man. She's portrayed as confident, strong, uh, assured, willful throughout, um, obviously only masculine qualities, heavy sarcasm, um, but there's something not quite right about her, though no one is sure what yet. And there's a lot of talk of fate and duty, and this came up in the morning session. Um, no one is immune from fate, um, but it is, how you react to it. Um, the word yoke is used quite a lot um, and Agamemnon's path is set, but he is referred to as putting the yoke of fate upon himself. And so he's sort of stumbling through life and maybe this is used as exoneration, but it is kind of an excuse for what he does. Well, Clytemnestra, yeah, free will is not the right word, but she is maneuvering within the tent poles of fate um to get what she wants so she sets the course of action at least uh for the duration of the play she steers all things towards their desired end and then you know as the house of atreus both you know house as a metaphor for the family and also the literal house um the house if it could speak would tell a tale if these walls could talk um and later cassandra who is agamemnon's trojan prisoner of war is cursed she's the one who's cursed to see the future but no one believes her she will speak for the house nope before that though uh agamemnon does return and this is how he is welcomed with a red river flowing across the stage clytemnestra says let the red stream flow and bear him home to the home he never hoped to see justice lead him in leave all the rest to me the spirit within me never yields to sleep. We will set things right with the God's help. We will do whatever fate requires. And so this is a very, it's not a rug, it is a tapestry and it is made with incredibly expensive dyes, um, which again, you know, it's thematic, but also kind of a flex from Aeschylus because um, they had to have it for the set design. Um, Agamemnon protests, since this is clearly fine tapestry and it's not meant to be stepped on, but after back and forth, he eventually does walk on it, which I think is emblematic of everything he does in life, where he puts up a brief protest, but then gives in. Uh, Cassandra still hovers by the door. She doesn't follow them in. Uh, Clytemnestra urges her in, but she doesn't move or speak until everyone but the chorus goes inside. And then she lets out a wail of lamentation and begins her prophecy. These are some snippets of what she says. It's a very long segment and the chorus responds in between these, but they're kind of useless. Um, Cassandra knows that a lot of people are about to die and she can sense the horrors that have already happened in the palace. Um, this is where we get some of the really gory snippets about the Feast of Atreus, as if the house is finally speaking the tale the Watchmen hinted at. Of course, no one believes her. And there is a bit of back and forth with the chorus about who will kill Agamemnon. Uh, Cassandra keeps saying she, the chorus keeps asking what man will do this. Uh, eventually Cassandra gets up the quote unquote courage to go inside where she is killed within seconds. Clytemnestra comes out vaunting over the dead body of Agamemnon and Cassandra and describes in detail how she killed him. So, a lot is being made of her doing the killing with her speech and the ramp up from Cassandra. And first it adds to the horror that a woman would be doing this, um, though it is also kind of a common fear in patriarchal societies, uh, men kind of telling on themselves by assuming wives are one bad day and a decent alibi away from snapping and murdering them. Um, 
but also I think this was an element of surprise for the audience because in Homer in the Odyssey, it was explicit that Aegisthus kills Agamemnon. Clytemnestra is there and she helps, but Aegisthus is the one who strikes the killing blow. In Aeschylus, in this play, it is very much Clytemnestra. She's taking full credit for it. Um, so, you know, based on that timeline of centuries passing, you know, maybe this had become a common version of the story. Uh, but I suspect not because of the big deal that is being made of it in the text by both Cassandra and Clytemnestra. So she describes with relish striking him with her axe three times and then says, and um, I do have a gift that has cinematic blood in it coming up. It's not gory, it's just, there's a lot of blood. So Clytemnestra says, so he goes down and the life bursting out of him, great sprays of blood and the murderous shower wounds me, dyes me black and I, I revel like the earth when the spring rains come down the blessed gifts of God and the new green spear splits the sheath and rips to birth and glory. So if that sounded vaguely erotic to you, that is correct. Uh, this is meant to be understood as Clytemnestra getting physical pleasure out of killing Agamemnon. This wasn't something that had to be done. She enjoyed it. Um, I do think this does take a tragic twist at the end of the trilogy. The play Agamemnon ends soon after with Clytemnestra and Aegisthus victorious. The middle play is The Libation Bearers, which is about Electra's re reunion with Orestes and uh, him going on to murder his mother. And the third play is The Eumenides, which means the kindly ones, which is referring to the Furies, uh, is arguably our first courtroom drama. Uh, and that is where Orestes, who has been beset by the Furies, pleads his case before Athena. Apollo is acting as his lawyer, and he makes the case that uh, Orestes didn't actually commit matricide because um, a woman is not really related to her children, but more akin to the ground in which seeds grow. So helpful, but not related to the seed itself. So the flowering metaphor, which Clytemnestra uses in Triumph, is turned into barrenness to exonerate her murderer. So again, that is the end of the notable members of the House of Atreus, and Orestes lives the rest of his life in peace and obscurity. So I hope this was interesting. Um, so some further resources. Uh, if you want to continue with this, there's obviously the Oresteia by Aeschylus. I like the Thagel's translation, but it really is dealer's choice. There's also Anne Oresteia, which is an Anne Carson project. She's a very beautiful and very loose translator, um, but she's put together the full story of the Oresteia, but using one play from each of our main three tragedians. Um, so that's Agamemnon by Aeschylus, Electra by Sophocles, and Orestes by Euripides. Um, and that's where we get the not to me, not if it's you bit. Uh, then there's Thyestes by Seneca, who is a Roman writer, so much later. Um, that has a translation by Emily Wilson. She's the one who just did that recent uh, Odyssey translation. She is fantastic. Getting more into fiction and modern work. Um, well, I have Shakespeare later, but um, there's Mary Renault. She was a mid 20th century writer. She wrote a lot of queer historical fiction set in ancient Greece. Um, the Mask of Apollo is her book about Greek theater culture. The main character is a main actor. Um, who does some light spying on the side. Um, there's Morning Becomes Electra by Eugene O'Neill. It's set just after the American Civil War, which is a direct allegory of Electra and um, Clymnestra. Titus Andronicus by Shakespeare. And then there's the Julie Taymor movie adaptation. And then I want to talk about the Center for Hellenic Studies YouTube page. They have been doing really cool stuff throughout the pandemic. Um, they've been doing Zoom readings of a lot of classic plays. They've done Agamemnon, they've done Thyestes. They are usually a bridge, but they also, you know, have talks from academics and translators. And they're doing really cool, they're making really cool choices with costuming and staging, um, despite it's people talking into their webcams, but they're, you know, doing really cool stuff with that. So that's all up on their YouTube, and I really recommend checking that out. And then, you know, I like talking about this stuff, obviously. So there's my email, there's my Twitter, uh, if you want to reach out. Um, but also if you have any questions now,
I would love to hear them. Questions, comments, snide remarks. Um, 